So in this um, short video, I'm going to just talk a little bit about some of the basic ways that economists can talk about or model um, uh, the behavior of unions. Um, this is by no means uh, exhaustive, um, but uh, given the tools that we have so far, I think these are some things that uh, that we can we can probably understand. Um, so here are the four ways that we're going to talk about um, uh, unions in this video. Uh, first, we're going to talk about unions as maybe just trying to influence uh, market forces of uh, supply and demand for labor uh, in order to change uh, wages or increase employment. Uh, we could talk about unions trying to subvert market forces through uh, market power. Uh, there are other ways they can do this that uh, that I'll mention. Um, we could talk about unions as representing um, a conflict between insiders and outsiders. Insiders are people who already have jobs and outsiders are people who don't. And so oftentimes insiders um, try to keep the outsiders out. And so we can talk about unions as doing that. And then finally we can talk about union um, behavior as being related to management. And so we can talk about a, a similar kind of conflict but between um, unions and management. Starting with the first one, influencing uh, market forces. Um, you know, the goal of the union will probably be to either increase wages or increase employment. And so we can think about our basic supply and demand model and ask, you know, how could the union accomplish either of these goals? Well, to raise wages, you will either have to increase demand or decrease supply. Uh, to increase employment, you'll either have to increase demand or increase supply. Uh, this, of course, is the supply and demand of labor that I'm talking about. Well, increasing demand is the only one that does both. Um, and so we could talk about what are the different ways that the union could increase the demand for uh, union labor. And if we go back to um, our model about labor demand, we, we recall that there are some of the things that, uh, that could do that. If the union somehow increased the productivity of its workers through training or um, um, uh, education benefits, if the worker, through maybe uh, advertising campaigns or something, uh, increased the demand for the union-made product, then that would increase the demand for the union worker. Um, if they did something to increase the avail availability of complementary inputs, so the things that they that go along with labor in production, if they can somehow uh, lobby for policies that make those things more available, or, on the other hand, to decrease the availability of uh, substitutable inputs. I have asterisks here because availability is kind of a, maybe not the best choice uh, for word, the word here, but, you know, anything that's going to make, um, change the, how much it costs or whether it's legal or anything like that is what I'm talking about here. So if there's a substitutable input like some machinery or some capital, if I can put policies in place that make that hard to get, um, then that can increase the demand for, uh, for labor. Of course, I can use government to do this as well by requiring that things be done by union labor and so on, uh, rather than non-union labor. And when it comes to decreasing supply, I guess we have to be kind of careful here whether we're talking about uh, supply in the whole industry or supply in the uh, of union labor, and we're probably talking about supply in the entire industry. This will raise wages, but of course decrease uh, industry employment. So one of the ways that you can do this is through licensure requirements. Um, you know, lawyers have a lot uh, fewer competitors because of licensure requirements, uh, and so their wages are higher. Long apprenticeships can do this. Um, permits and other regulations. Where I live, if I wanted to do anything to my house, uh, um, you know, electrical or anything otherwise, I would have to get a permit, and I'd have to have somebody who was um, licensed to do it. Uh, and so these kinds of things, when done by unions, can... can represent this decrease in the supply of labor that drives wages up. Uh, and then just basically any, any other kind of rent-seeking behavior, any, any way that the union uses government to keep people um, uh, out. There's, of course, some overlap between this idea and the insider-outsider that we'll talk about later. Uh, increasing supply, while it would increase employment, uh, it would decrease wages, and there's not a lot of reason to believe that unions would do this. Um, if we have a union that's attempting to organize a lot of people and increase its numbers, it's usually not in order to increase employment, but rather uh, to gain market power. So this kind of, uh, uh, mar of union activity in markets, I, I don't think is very um, practical. Uh, if we want to talk about uh, market power, though, that brings us to our second way that uh, unions can, can um, achieve their goals by subverting market forces. 
Um, and market power is a good way to do that. Remember your model of a monopoly. If the union represents all workers, then it's the sole seller of labor, and it has monopoly power. Um, and so we get the monopoly results. We get a quantity supplied that's too low to be socially optimal, and we get a price that's higher than marginal cost. So the price, in this case, the wage, is too high. So just like a monopoly selling a product is going to sell too little of it and charge too much, a monopoly representing workers is going to uh, employ too few workers and pay them too much. Um, now, if the firm also has market power, market power on the side of buyers is called monopsony power, uh, then we have a less obvious result. Um, because with the monopoly, we usually see too little um, quantity and, and uh, too high a price. With a monopsony, we see too little quantity and too low a price. So we know that if we have market power on both sides of the market, buyers and sellers of labor, employment will be too low, but we don't it's not clear what will happen to wage, whether the wage will be the high wage the monopoly seller, the union, wants, or the low wage that the monopsony buyer wants, and that will come down to bargaining power and things like that. Okay. Also, I should point out that another way that the union can subvert market forces is by just going around them and going to government and having government um, you know, uh, do these things um, on their behalf, um, you know, requiring that people use union work and so on. Um, you can talk about unions as being as representing the struggle between people who are already employed and people who aren't. Um, uh, so if the people who are already working have some somehow have different opportunities or are in a better position than those that are not working, then we can use this kind of theory to talk about it. Since unions only represent workers, um, it's fairly obvious to, to, to think about it in this way because you know we it, it can be workers versus those not working or l later workers versus. Uh, and managers, you know, so these are the two different kinds of conflicts that can exist. Um, the insiders might be able to resist competition with outsiders. They might be able to do something once they're inside that stops people outside from competing. Um, you know, it, it, personal experience uh, of adjunct faculty unions tells me that this is exactly what they do. There are places where um, the adjunct faculty are unionized, but if you're not already working there, um, it's very difficult to get in. Um, and uh, and this is exactly um, what's happening here. This is insider outsider thing. You can actually think of the minimum wage as an example of this. Okay, so suppose I have two kinds of workers: skilled workers who are unionized and unskilled workers who aren't. So if I have this kind of productivity data and wage rate data for the two workers, which type of worker is a better bargain for the firm? The skilled worker can produce 20 units an hour, and I have to pay them $30. So I'm basically paying a dollar fifty per unit, right? thirty dollars divided by twenty units. For the unskilled worker, I only have to pay them five dollars and they can produce four units per hour. So um, if, if I hire unskilled workers, I'm getting output at a dollar twenty five per unit, right? I'm gonna need more of the workers, sure, but it's still cheaper to produce this way. So if these are the wage rates and this is the productivity, then the unskilled worker is a better bet, uh, better buy. But if the minimum wage is set at seven dollars, okay, if the union successfully lobbies for a high minimum wage then this 5 becomes a 7, and then the savings from unskilled workers are eliminated because 7 divided by 4 is $1.75 per unit. So raising the minimum wage is a way to keep the unskilled workers uh, uncompetitive, really, because their wage is too high um, uh, compared to their actual productivity. And so that's one example, one of you know, many examples of insider-outsider stuff. Um, many economists use the tools of game theory to discuss the relationship between union and management. It's a, um, it's a strategic relationship. So we can think of negotiating over contract as, as fitting right into this. You know, each side thinks carefully about what it asks for, what it accepts, what information it reveals, um, what information it doesn't reveal. Having more information than the other person in the game, of course, gives you an advantage. Um, and so when you talk about people behaving st strategically like this, you can use the... Um, the tools of game theory. Uh, in a separate PowerPoint, in a separate video, I have a simplified bargaining, you know, game theory model, uh, with a um, uh, that, that will kind of go through one of these things. Um, this is just one possible application. I understand that the tools of game theory are very vast, so you know, I, you could really do a whole lot with this. But this is one of the kinds of um, uh, um, types of analysis that economists use when talking about uh, unions and management. 
So just to summarize, you know, the, this is just an introduction to the different ways that economists can think about uh, the behavior of unions. Uh, and there is overlap between some of these things, you know. Um, so it's not that it has to be one or the other. Unions can uh, um, employ a combination of strategies or approaches, and likewise we can employ a combination of approaches when modeling unions. Um, you could probably teach an entire course on each one of these, okay? So they're, 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 they're very, very deep. Um, they can go very deep. Uh, what I want for you to understand is sort of the basics, and I think when it comes to basic supply-demand kind of stuff or monopoly kind of stuff, I think that those you have the skills to, to do that kind of analysis. And, of course, other possibilities um, besides these exist. Um, so that's, that's that.